Okay, so England Samoa, the first test is finished. Um, England win 34 18. Um, first half, Samoa were poor. Uh, second half was very entertaining. Um, was it the best quality game I've ever seen? No. I have seen better internationals, I've seen better club games. But the second half was entertaining, and the handbags right at the end, I think. Yeah, you can. 10, 15 years ago, we, we get a bit of biff there, and I, I think the game's missing that little bit of uh, aggression and intensity with the old biff. Uh, get some punches thrown, please. Um, but it, you could see by the end, Samoa were frustrated, I think, more with themselves. I think it was a silly penalty that Tyrell Manning has given away, not releasing Mate Lees. Yeah, it, it does lead to a bit of, bit of, bit of, bit of pushing and shoving uh, and a few uh, strong words being said, but no actual punches thrown, hence why I call it handbags. But the game itself... Uh, things I noticed, uh, Anthony Milford, passenger in attack and defence. In fact, if anything, Anthony Milford was hampering Samoa's right-hand side defence and is at fault for a couple of tries in the first half when he just shoots out the line and the rest of his defensive side of the field stay the 10 metres, whereas Milford's just shot up and, and the rest of the line hasn't shot up with him. If they all shoot up at the same time, so the back row forward, the centre and the winger, that's different. Milford shoots out, there is no call, and the rest of the defensive line Stays where they are. So that leads to Hurt, Farnworth's try and Matty Ashton's try. You could argue, yes, the swinging momentum with the six again and silly penalties being given away in the build-up to those tries have given England the territory. But Milford's defensive reads were poor. He was exposed defensively. And in attack, he did nothing, he, which put a lot of pressure on Luai to, to create plays under pressure, under pressure kicking, under pressure with ball in hand, having to you know move ball quickly, that kind of thing. And Luai's a good player. Uh, unnecessary pressure put upon him because Milford is a passenger. So the far worth trying seven minutes. Yet, yeah, okay, there is a six again in there, but Milford, yeah, just shoots up out the line. Matty Ashen's first try, same thing again. Um, Milford, bad read defensively. The rest of his outside backs and back row forward, they stay in line. They don't push up with him, so there's no call there. He just shoots up. And it completely dog legs the defence, makes it easier for Maddie Ashton. And then George Williams, they just don't tackle him. Uh, it's great support play. Um, you know, there was a video ref review on that one. Potential double movement, he wasn't held. Uh, but this is where support play, dog leg defence, um, you know, defensive organisation's gone at this point for Samoa. They're all over the place. And England, the, the possession stats are pretty even. It, it was the territory that's doing it. And so they are making defensive errors. They're making poor defensive reads. And England have got some good support play. Now, 16-0. This is the point where I think England have played the referee better. Now, yes, you could argue England have a majority of their players are Super League base alongside their NRL talent. Super League referee, you could argue Super League interpretation of the rules is different to the NRL interpretation of the rules. And we will have that argument. That argument's not going away. But in every single professional sport, at club or international level, you always have to be prepared for the referee to call the game his way. So I think England also researched how this referee calls the game. The Super League players in the camp and in the squad would have said, he calls the game like this. He calls it pretty, pretty strict uh, in the ruck area or the play the ball or the tackle, whatever it may be, the offside. This is how... This referee calls the game. He may be stricter in certain areas, looser in others, a bit more even, a bit more standard, you know, by the book in certain bits. That's that referee's interpretation of the laws of the game. Samoa didn't play the referee right. You've also got to play what's in front of you. And this Samoa side is not as strong as the side of the World Cup a couple of years ago. It's still a stacked team. You look at you've got Roger Tuivasa Shek in there. One one of the best fullbacks the game has seen when he's at his best. You've got Luai, a four-time Premiership winner in there. Tago, multiple Premiership winner with Penrith. You've got some good players. NRL standard players. A lot of those Samoan players, if they had decided to put their hand up for Australia or New Zealand, could potentially get selected for the Kiwis or, or the uh, Australian side that's playing the Pacific Championship right now. But they did not apply themselves to that first half. That first 20 minutes killed them. Killed them. And that's, I think, where England have won the game in that first 20 minutes where England were structured, um, just did the basics. Then 16 nil up, England start getting a little bit over overplaying their hand, which leads to Dean Mariner's intercept try. Completely, Daryl Clark doesn't need to throw that pass. It's a completely unnecessary pass to throw. 
they've, they've got them defensively shot. Mariner does read that pass very, very well. Intercept, runs half the length of the field, scores an unopposed try. And from that moment onwards, the game did loosen up. Became a bit more unstructured, which suited Samoa. Now, half-time comes at 16-6, but the game has started to loosen up. England have also thrown another potential intercept, and there would be a knock-on intercept that leads to another try later on. So England did become a little bit more loose. They lost their structure a little bit, lost the control of the game, whereby that first half, that first 20 minutes, they won the game. After that, they just got too loose, a bit more impatient. They wanted to score on every play. It, it, it goes a bit wrong. However, Victor Radley's try comes on 49 minutes just after half time and as soon as that happens the game really opens up because Dean Mariner gets his second try Poor kick, a, a sloppy loose kick chase the kick is good the kick chase is dog legged and Skelton starts the move with a great run and his opposite winger Dean Mariner comes across and finishes off the move and there's some great handling skills Samoa keep the ball alive now part of the reason why they have to keep the ball alive is is Anthony Milford is a passenger putting a lot of pressure on Luai in a perfect Perfect game. Lou I will probably kick that through, a little grubber kick or a little chip kick. But because the game is so unstructured and, and Milford's doing nothing to help his halves partner, they keep the ball alive, ball in hand, they decide to offload. They just they're, they're getting a bit desperate. But actually, to be fair, it is a well worked try. It's a fun try to watch. It's probably one of the tries of the season um, from one end to the other. They go a hundred meters in a set. It's great entertainment. They thoroughly deserve that try with how they played. Because when they had a bit of ball in hand and a bit of territory, they did look dangerous. They did look dangerous. Now, Matty Ashton gets his second try of the game on fifth, a few minutes later on 59 minutes. So the momentum's swinging now, and England open up a little bit. Now, it's in this period where it's very noticeable that Roger Tuovar-Shek is defending very, very shallow. And England start doing little cheeky chip, chip, chip kicks over the top, uh, which leads to... You know, Matty Ashton's try is that chip kick. Two of Arthur Sheck is, is too shallow. He needs to be slightly deeper to therefore hoover up that, and that negates the chip kick. So he, they're taking him out of play, and then he's having to chase back. Uh, Matty Ashton, great support play, getting getting up off his wing into the middle of the field after you know a cheeky chip ahead. Uh, Harry Smith converts that one. Mikey Lewis's try. Uh, they did try a similar play down there, their right side involving Dom Young, which came off a chip kick. It, it didn't work out. He couldn't get the pass uh, to hand. So instead of chipping over, they decided to do the mispass. Um, Wellsby mispass, brilliant, to Dom Young. Uh, he puts uh, the ball back inside, and there's Mikey Lewis, a uh, great support play from the dummy uh, uh, backup dummy half on 71 minutes. So... Yeah, they, they worked that very well. Again, they've worked out two of Arsha Shek. He's very, very shallow. He's out of position. And therefore, these kind of mispass plays or chip kick plays are going to pay off. That is not un that is actually a structured play. They've done their homework on two of Arsha Shek. They've obviously watched him play at fullback for the Warriors uh, this season and in previous seasons with the Roosters as well when he uh, was fullback or in the wing positions when he's covering one of the back three positions. They've worked out at times he can come very shallow in part because potentially two of Arshashek doesn't have trust in, in, in the defence in front of him and when you've got a player like Milford who has been a passenger all game that puts pressure on the full back to cover because sometimes one of the halves will drop back to sweep up loose balls Milford's not doing that so it's putting pressure on two of Arshashek to come in shallower it's just something I've noticed now uh, Cham, Chang Kom Tong that comes off again, forcing the play by England. They've, they've had two really good tries there where they're a bit, bit ad lib, a little bit taking risks. They take another unnecessary pass and it's a knock on intercepts. And uh, uh, Chang Kum Tong under the posts on, for his try to 76 minutes. So basically, two of the three tries, well, England are really gifted to Samoa. The, the second try for Dean Mariner, Samoa had to finish that. Um, but England got a bit loose there. Defensively, they got shot, and Samoa, with their handling skills and what they do in the NRL, when, when they, they picked up their intensity as well, which was very noticeable. Uh, first half, Samoa didn't have the intensity in possession. That second half, they were better, and it shows on the scoreboard, England only slightly edging the second half. Then we have the unnecessary handbags. <clears throat> this is the fun bit. Now, 10 years ago, that's a full-blown full blown 30-man brawl. It'd be like Battle of Brookvale a decade ago. 
May on Lee's, you hear the referee shout held, he doesn't release, he brings them to the ground. Completely unnecessary. So it's only a, it's only a penalty only for not releasing. The handbags. You can see Samara are frustrated. Pop most likely with themselves, how the how the refing of the game has been potentially. Do they feel the referees not calls haven't gone their way? Whatever it may be. You can see Samara are frustrated. You can see England have got a bit sloppy as well in their play at points in the second half, which has allowed Samoa to linger in the game. There's a bit of lingering frustration and it boils over. Now as I say, five, ten, fifteen years ago, that is a full blown punch up. All players involved, you will, you know, that famous, the famous, uh, that's diabolical um, commentary spray from the early 90s. It, that would be that kind of level of, of, of commentary, an origin spray of, of, of like Harrigan and, and uh, Bella, for example, going at it. That's what it would have been a decade or so ago, 15 years ago. Now, I think the game at all levels is missing that a little bit bit of the biff. Uh, I'm one of those who thinks, you know, the game has lost something when you lose that kind of intimidation and intensity from the game. Don't get me wrong, there were some big hits in this game, some big tackles and hits. Um, and very, and I think only one high tackle in the whole game. So the tackle technique was a lot better, but you could definitely see um, the frustration building with Samoa. You could see they were a bit frustrated. You know, they're sipping sour, uh before the game. You could see there was some intent in that now maybe they got a little bit over emotional in that and that cost them in that first half where they put too much emotion into their sippy tower and they lost a bit of focus for the first 20 minutes and England wrote that they they stood up to it you know did they controlled their emotions a bit better you could argue but overall it was a, it was a decent test match was it the best test match I've seen no I've seen I have seen better test matches and, and club games but that second half was entertaining uh, when it loosened up a little bit, became very, very open. Um, if anything, it would have been better for the channel if Samoa would have won, because the view counts would have gone through the roof. So I'm not expecting this to break view records. However, whenever I do a coverage of a rugby league test match, the view counts are always pretty good, especially if it involves a Pacific Island nation, South Sea Island team. The view counts are always pretty strong. Um, and I do appreciate the support from Down Under. I do, because um, it is obviously the other... No, what 11 hours ahead so this is going to be early in the morning down under for those who've stayed up or woke up early to watch this game fair play to you but yeah I was a little bit disappointed with Samoa today this isn't their strongest squad that they could put on the field they are missing a lot of players there's a lot of players who could have played who aren't playing which is a shame and yeah player welfare is key and, and some of them have decided that I need to you know rest up some injuries and all that. But if Samoa put their strongest team on the field, I think this game would have been potentially different. I think England would have found it a much tougher, tougher test. Now, last year, that Tongan side was the best Tongan side that they could put on the field for players available. Samoa, I think, are a little bit better than Tonga right now. Um, but close. And, and Tonga pushed Australia close uh, last weekend. So... The South Sea Island nations are massively improving. So are Papua New Guinea as well. And I think International Rugby League can only benefit from, um, you know, if I, w I would love to see PNG tour England, for example. I think that would be a lot of fun. But we've got Australia touring next year. This bodes well for the second test. Uh, it does. And the way the referee dealt with the handbags at the end, whether you thought he had a good game or not, he said, look, lads, I'm only going to give a penalty. I can't see any punches thrown. I'm not going to put anyone on report. We've got a minute or so left. I don't want to have to have send players to the bin. I don't want to have to put players on report because you've got a big game next week to decide this series and you guys want to play it. So I think he dealt with that at the end pretty well, but it would have been kind of cool just to see the you know, gloves get dropped and have a few swinging a few a few a few knuckle sandwiches might have might have brought back some memories of yesteryear. It would have made it a bit more interesting. But we'll see what squads get selected for test two. But there we go, there's the review of uh, England Samoa. I think you could argue, again, discussion about international referees and who should referee test matches. Should it be a Super League ref? Should it be a, an NRL ref? Does the IRL need to have separate officials or mixed officials where the linos maybe are NRL, the refs in uh, Super League or vice versa? Mix up the officiating team. You know, who's going to pay for that? But all in all, it's a decent test match, entertaining. One final note... Um, 
a lot of empty seats. They didn't sell out the game. And that's on the RFL. Uh, I cannot believe there was empty seats in Wigan for a test match. I cannot believe that. And that is disappointing. Um, very disappointing on, on the rugby league side of things that empty seats. When you know, you've got the best that England have and the best available Samoan players who were available for this test match who put their hand up to were either fit enough or rested enough to play because of the brutal NRL finals series that we've had. Um, empty seats like that is disappointing. I'm very disappointed with the empty seats. But I've been saying this since 2018 when they couldn't set out the three venues for the New Zealand tour. Um, and I had some concerns six years ago. Those concerns still exist now, six years later. Uh, so I've been doing this now for seven years. Six years ago, 2018, against New Zealand, empty seats, very obvious. Couldn't sell out Rugby League Heartlands. Couldn't even sell out the lower tiers at Anfield. Wigan, Rugby League Heartland, you know, empty seats. Very obvious empty seats in every single stand, which is disappointing. Uh, it would have been nice to see a sellout, but it is what it is. Um, so questions have to be asked of the RFL and how they promoted the game and and such. But we'll see what the attendance is like next week. We've got a double header England play Wales in the women's uh, international, which should be fun. And then England's small second test, so we'll be watching both of them. But for me for now, thank you very much for watching. I'll have some more content for you guys very, very soon.